Meet the Dermestid beetle. Usually at home in the forests of the Northwest, this little critter is on the U.S. government payroll. Its take-home pay is all you can eat. I'm sure they're pretty hungry. And this is a nice, fresh body for them to work on. Forensic scientists use these flesh-eating beetles to strip animal carcasses down to the bone. The beetles are just one tool used at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's forensics lab in Ashland, Oregon. It's the only lab in the world dedicated to solving crimes against wildlife. Ken Goddard is the director. Much like any other police crime laboratory, we do two basic things. We identify evidence. In a triangular fashion, we attempt to link suspect, victim, and crime scene together with that evidence. The big difference in our case is, one, our victim is a non-human animal. Two, we generally don't get a whole animal in. We get pieces, parts, products. The lab takes cases from across the United States and around the world. It's the official crime lab for CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. The CITES Treaty is the international agreement that governs trafficking of rare plants and animals. Here in the lab, a menagerie of the colorful, the unusual, and the hunted is interspersed among the high-tech equipment of forensic science. The facility features a pathology lab where medical examiners determine how an animal died a ballistics lab where bullets can be linked to poachers' guns, a genomics lab where DNA testing is done, and a morphology lab where biologists identify the evidence. In fact, that's the most common request they get. Basically, you would not continue investigation unless you were pretty sure you're dealing with endangered or threatened species. If it's wolf parts, sure, you're going to go after that. If it's coyote fur, uh, probably not. Because the Ashland Lab is the only one of its kind, the onus has been on Goddard and his staff of 15 forensic experts to develop new ways to analyze evidence and secure convictions. Deputy Lab Chief Ed Espinoza has been responsible for many of the innovations in forensic technology and techniques. His latest challenge has been figuring out how to identify species of trees. You might not think of trees as typical wildlife. Illegal logging may not attract the same attention as rhino, tiger, or elephant poaching, but trees are a vital part of any ecosystem, and CITES lists nearly 50 threatened and endangered timber species. U.S. federal agents have begun seizing shipments of illegally trafficked wood, rare species like Brazilian rosewood. It garners a hefty price on the black market and is prized in making furniture and musical instruments but determining which type of rosewood was used is impossible after the limbs, leaves, and DNA-rich sapwood have been removed. These two woods are visually and morphologically indistinguishable. They have very similar names. One's called Brazilian rosewood, the other one's called Amazonian rosewood. Most of us, in our head, they become synonymous. The Amazon is Brazil, therefore it's the same thing, right? And so it's, it's kind of a trick in terms of the naming, but one is protected, Delbergia negra or Brazilian rosewood is protected, and Delbergia spruciana or Amazonian rosewood is not. So the challenge for us is, the scientific challenge, can we separate these two in order to enforce society's treaty? To do that, Espinoza and his team innovated a way to identify protected species of wood using a technology called a dart mass spectrometer. First, he planes off a small sliver from the evidence sample. Then, he puts the dart to work. The machine ionizes and identifies molecules in the wood, chemical compounds that are unique to a specific species of tree. It then spits out the data. Each one of these peaks corresponds to a distinct, different molecule that is present in the rosewood. From my experience, I know that this particular peak, which is a compound called caviunin, is specific to Delbergia negra. Comparing the data to a growing library of chemical signatures, Espinoza can positively identify the wood, and in some cases even determine where the specific tree grew. Yeah, I think these wood cases are far more important than just the wood. I mean, trees can be regrown. You know, it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, it may take a while. You know, you don't, you don't get a big redwood replacement uh, in a few years, uh, but they are replaceable. That may not be true for the species that lived in that forest. That may be one of the last survival points. We've got to be really careful about that. This year, the lab's staff is expanding by about 50 percent, letting it take on more cases. But Goddard says it will take more than just an increase in manpower. Uh, we made great advances. 
over this uh, last 25 years, uh, but we've got a long way to go. Law enforcement doesn't resolve issues. The best that we can do is hold things at bay, keep them from getting worse until smarter people come along. Until then, Ken Goddard and his team will keep working sliver by sliver, beetle bite by beetle bite, using innovation and forensic science to bring wildlife traffickers to justice.